So I begin by uh, thanking you very much for your willingness to come and participate in the Hearts of Freedom Project. Mm -hmm. Your participation is very much appreciated. Thanks very much. Um, I'll begin by asking you your name, please. Uh, my name is uh, Vin Hyun. Okay. And uh, where were you born? I was born in the city of Bingwar in the province of Dong Nai in southern Vietnam okay. in 1969. Would, would that have been some distance from the capital? Uh, yes, uh, Bien Hoa is uh, about 30 kilometers plus northeast of the capital at that time, Saigon. Okay. So uh, I'll begin by asking you, uh, do you have memories of your childhood in, in Vietnam that you could share with us? Yes, I certainly have a significant number of memories, and so I'll attempt to just create a little bit of narrative of what it was yeah, like. And sure. Because those are the stories that continue to sound through your hearts and your mind and your spirit because they make up who, who we are and who I am. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think for me, uh, a big part of that is uh, that, you know, the, the land and the water has an uh, imprint on me. Uh, it's a lush, beautiful country with uh, lots of trees, shaded trees, and uh, foliage and vegetations. And uh, in the city of Bien Hoa, it's right next to the river, uh, Dong Nai River. And so, you know, we were very close to the river. And I still remember distinctively uh, crossing, there's the old bridge, which is kind of the old French built bridge with the uh, cantilever kind of iron works. And then there's new concrete bridge on the other side. And so I always take joy in terms of just uh, being immersed in that kind of land and water. And, um, some of the early experiences, I was, uh, I still remember going to school for the first time when I was three and my dad wanted me and my mom wanted me to go to school and so just remembering the uh, crying and being at, uh, being dropped up at school and not wanting to be separated from my parents. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, amazing that uh, I've been going to school for the last 40 some years, starting at the age of three. Um, so some of the memories, one that I always carry on is uh, I love fountain pens because uh, that's how I grew up learning to write. And so to okay. this day, my most natural tendency is to write with a fountain pen. Okay. It's part of who I am. These are things that are the, um, the DNA of who you are that you uh, gravitate to, even though uh, you, know, you grow in years. Um, in addition to that, I still remember, I mean, my family was uh, not wealthy, but they're not uh, destitute we were okay and so you know we had a life of that was um, that's good and yet at the same time we were living side by side with uh, those of our citizens who did not necessarily have uh, as much and so two clear memories that kind of point out to me how the, the fortune that I had and the blessing that I had was you know my dad and uh, had picked me up and at that time he, he drove a red motorcycle and so uh, that's our version of the minivan. So they, my two brother, my brother and I will be put in the front right on top of the gas tank there, and my mom will be in the back with my, my other brother. And so um, that's how we travel. And I still remember once when he was kind of putting me up there, uh, we had been given some um, uh, roasted rice paper uh, crackers. And in the process of just moving us around, it broke and some of it fell on the ground. And I still remember another young boy who's roughly my age running up to pick up my leftovers. Okay. And so um, those, those are the imagery that holds to mind in terms of what I have and what others don't have. I always keep my, and then another one, our family went out for a wonton noodle soup in the marketplace. My aunt had made some wonton and she wanted to uh, have the, uh, the noodle makers just put it in to make it for us. And though as she was, we were eating it, we had leftovers, and I could still see this um, young girl and her little brother just waiting, looking at us, um, begging eyes. And then when we were finished, she asked him, could we have your leftovers? And she took it and put it into her, um, her little pail so they eat. So again, I'm reminding of um, you know, my heart dissonance at, at that time. That's how the best thing I can describe in terms of what I have and what others do not have. Yes. And, um, then another memory would have been the fall of, of, of southern Vietnam uh, in mm -hmm. Saigon at that time. My father was in the army at that time, and my mom was a seamstress. And so as the war was drawing to a close, um, 
my dad made the decision with my mom to go into Saigon, into the center of the city, hoping that with the bigger metropolis it would be safer. And so we actually ended up staying with my great auntie for a while. And, uh, you know, as a child of um, five or six at that time, I still remember being on the third floor of the balcony, looking over into the road and then seeing the uh, ovens um, units passing through and uh, you know, they would be resting and these will be um, fully armed uh, Southern Army uh, people and they would line up on both sides of the roads and uh, they would rest and then they would get up and move on. And then shortly after that, seeing the uh, uh, Northern uh, groups come in and pursue and walk through. And so um, just yeah, and being mindful that uh, the war was just right out front of my, mm -hmm. uh, my our houses. And so subsequent to that, we made our way back to, um, uh, to, to Bienghua. And I still remember my uncle driving my family. And on the way back, uh, just seeing out on the road and the roadside, just literally uh, um, uh, scattered weapons and boots and uh, um, military uniforms, uh, damaged uh, armored personnel tanks. It was like literally seeing the detritus of war spread out yeah, before my eyes. And yeah. this would have been in 1975. Yeah, that so it'd be in the, the April. Well, the fall would be April 30th, 1975. So yeah. it would have been uh, April and May. April and May. Okay. Those would be the memories. Yeah. So you mentioned you you had a brother. Did you have other siblings? Uh, yes. So I um, I have two brothers. Okay. Uh, and then the two youngest is uh, the, the sisters. So there's five of us. Okay. My uh, second brother passed away shortly after the war finished, okay. and so I have a, another younger brother. Okay. Uh, who now lives in Ottawa. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you, you said that you, for a period you went to live with, with your aunt in yeah. Saigon? Uh, the whole family moved whole to family. Saigon, right. just okay. as a way my parents thought it would be safer in the bigger right. capital. So okay. we were there for a good uh, uh, month as the offensive was building up in terms of the intensity of the fight and the conflicts. Okay. And then you went back to your village? When, um, no, it's a city. Um, oh, okay. it's, it's a good-sized city, Binghua, yes. Okay. Yeah. And do, do you recall how long you would have been back at your city? Uh, in Binghua? When you left, when you left uh, Saigon. Yeah, so basically after that month of stay in Saigon and things have settled, we returned to Binghua and we stayed there till 79 before we left. Oh, okay. Yeah. For another four years. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, so that means that from 75 to 79, you lived under the new regime, with yes. the change in the regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can, do you have any memories of that? Can you describe what that would have been like? Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was a time of transitions, a time of drastic transitions. Uh, a number of things happened. My dad had been, um, he was a corporal and a quartermaster's in the uh, Binghua, uh, based out of Binghua there, right? And so uh, he was also uh, very much a person who, uh, uh, a networker and an influencer. And so at that time, my, um, uh, my mom's brother, uh, the second oldest in the family in Vietnam, had, um, he had been an officer in the uh, Arvin Army, an um, artillery officer. And he was with his unit in the southern side of Vietnam. And he was one of the few units, the last unit to, to surrender. They kept on, on right. uh, yeah. They were fighting right to the end before the okay. capitulations of surrender, and so he was uh, part of that group that I guess uh, were, were captured and then sent into the the camp. And so my maternal grandfather said to my dad, saying, well, um, "Could you please go and and find your brother-in-law?" Because okay. my dad had the. Uh, so my dad went and looked for my uh, brother-in-law. I mean, his brother-in-law, my uncle, and in that process, he. He had gone to these camp looking for uh, for him, and then this story he told uh, us upon his release was that uh, he was uh, dressed very nicely, and you know, uh, in a, uh, nice short white shirts and, and plants. And then, as he was asking questions about him, the uh, northern Vietnamese uh, officials asked him who who he is, who he was, and where did he come from. And then when they found out that he was also a soldier, they said, you know, you can come in too as well. So my dad was also incarcerated. And so while this was happening, uh, my mom would, uh, well, he, there were basically the, the, three, um, the three of us, right? my, uh, my, my 
myself and my two brothers. Um, she was trying to you know, get, get her grounding in terms of where we now, in terms of like how we're going to make a living and, and mm -hmm. what happens to the capital we crew. And I still remember her bringing a sack full of uh, you know, uh, the, the piastia, the money back, and then pouring out and it was pretty well worthless. So for many of the families, uh, their, uh, their, their cash holdings all of a sudden became zero. And so that was a pretty big hit for a lot of families, you know, then uh, losing the economic capital that way yes. in the transitions. And so she was pretty, um, yeah, I think back, and you say, you know, as a young mom and all of a sudden finding that you've lost uh, capitals and also, more importantly, your husband is now incarcerated. Yeah. So that was tough for her, and then uh, as well, it was during that time as well. What I, uh, um, I was playing on the, uh, you know, in, in Vietnam in the street, and I just happened to run across the street, and I was hit by a motorcycle, oh. uh, and so it was burned pretty badly in the hip. And then I still remember, you know, I mean, there was no ambulance back then, and there was a, the neighbors just scrambled, and you know, someone put me on a motorbike and held me. And then my mom was next to uh, another person on a motorbike, and she's asking, how are you doing? And it was like a shock, taking me to the hospital, and I had emergency um, uh, resurgery to the side of my head and also my hip and all that. And so, yeah, it, it, that was a lot of stress for my mom, yeah. almost losing her son, and lost, losing her husband to the, the, uh, the camp at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, those were the, uh, the stress situation that uh, right. you know that added to that transition for our family right so as a young child did you have an opportunity to recover from your wounds from yeah I, I did I mean okay. I was in the hospital for a good uh, three four days there and okay. then uh, thank goodness I was uh, able to be released much to my mom's uh, um, uh, she was very thankful that yes. I was uh, able to get my health back right and uh, so your mother would have had to support the family while your dad was Incarcerated. Yes, so my, my family actually is uh, lived with my maternal uh, grandparents okay. and my uh, uncles and uh, aunties. Okay. So we basically grew up in an extended family. We okay. had one room, and then at one point there was everybody shared a bed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, was it some time before your father was eventually in car uh, released? Released, yes. Um, I think the key thing was that he was very mindful in saying, look, I, I was basically a quartermaster, I was a corporal, I was in charge of supplies. I wasn't involved in any fight, uh, right. fighting or anything like that. Yeah. And uh, he was very mindful to, uh, to, be, uh, um, to make sure that he was, uh, you know, uh, making sure that he, he understood what his role is and that he's prepared to accept, uh, you know, the, the role of that, that involved with being mm -hmm. um, citizen of a unified country yeah. and so based on that he was released uh, he was in there for a good uh, year and a half of, okay. uh, and and it was interesting because you know I mean he was always a bit um, uh, as my uncles and auntie would say a bit sickly in terms of uh, not necessarily having hail strength but that year and a half of hard labor uh, working in the fields and all that yeah. really um, improved his uh, his strength in that way okay. so I still remember you know uh, because our family lives in, um, uh, they call it, uh, you know, Hem, which is like the, uh, the alleyway, right? From the main street, you have to go through a series alleyway to get to your house. And, you know, one day, it was an afternoon, I was sitting there looking, I guess, to my dad would have been pretty full on, kind of, you know, thinking about him. And then I happened to look out, and there he was, walking down the Hem, the alleyway. And, uh, you know, we're not necessarily the most emotional people in that way. But I still remember just saying, Dad's home, Dad's home, Dad's home, and running up to him. I didn't hug him, but, you know, my way it was I took the bag that he was carrying, and then I ran ahead to um, almost like as a hero to uh, announce the good news to the, the entire neighborhood and my mom. Okay. So that was a time of, uh, of great joy that our family was able to uh, be reunited again. Okay. So I'm assuming that... Uh once your father was released and back with the family, uh, after some period, the family would have decided to make the decision to leave the country. Yeah, so it would, be in, it would have been around late uh, 76 okay. when he was released. And so upon his release, he, you know, he, was, uh, he was a very determined man. So was my mom, is that we need to build up um, 
capital, economic capital again. Right. And that uh, saving grace and all this, all these years is that, you know, I mean, uh, my parents lived with my grandparents, and so they shared house, and so they're able to save quite a lot. Okay. A good thing that, uh, you know, as most Asians uh, around that area, you don't put everything into cash. So the other is a way in which you uh, keep wealth, and thank goodness we had that. And so dad dove into the work of um, economic activities within a really restrictive uh, kind of atmosphere to do what he could in order to uh, make more capital for the family. Mm -hmm. And so that was his singular focus for pretty well the, uh, the entire remaining time that we had in Vietnam. Okay. And so, you know, I mean, people were being sent to the new economic zone, uh, businesses were being closed down, and, uh, you know, everything, uh, collectivization was very much in play. And so it was an interesting time. You know, we want to be, you want to be law abiding and you want to mm -hmm. make sure that, but the, if the laws are changing, uh, you have to find what it is that you need to be uh, law abiding about. Yes. And so doing that process as you discern this is what is required of you to live, uh, what's your decision? And so um, sure enough, within a couple of years, 77, 78, um, things got really much, so much more difficult for those of us who are, uh, you know, we're Vietnamese, yep. but we are ethnic Chinese. Uh, I mean, you look back far enough, we're Vietnamese, Chinese, probably Laos and Cambodians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but our identity is very much that we are Vietnamese citizen with a Chinese ethnic background. And so, um, pretty well when the border situation started happening in, uh, in China. I mean, that's an outflow as well in terms of the conflict that was happening in terms of the invasion of Cambodia as well, right? Um, yeah, one of my cousins, for example, uh, signed up with the, the, the army and fought in, in that border war, and we never saw him again. And, uh, you know, we felt a lot of pressure as, as, a, as a people group. Yes. And so around 78, that's when we started, okay, a number of us started moving. One of my uh, uncle number seven, he, he saw way ahead of time. So he actually uh, devised a plan and bought his own boat and they were actually gone by 77. So oh, okay. that was more the unofficial group without official sanction. Yes. He arranged for him and a group of people and they left. And so my dad saw that and uncle number seven uh, was always influential in his life because when my dad uh, was a young boy, a young man, he left being as well to go to Saigon, to go to high school. And this will be the uncle that he stayed with. So he picked up a lot, you know, a lot of times, what you learn is not necessarily taught, it's caught. So that spirit of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of trailblazing, uh, that spirit of leadership and initiative was, uh, was earned. And so he started looking for himself, okay, uncle number seven's leaving, number of people leaving, and you know, we don't see a future here for us uh, in terms of uh, what's happening. Uh, then we need to uh, consider um, leaving. So uh, your, you as you just mentioned, your uncle left first, mm. and that would have uh, led your dad to reflect on, oh yeah, mm. I should start thinking about. Yeah, um, yeah. My young, great uncle leaving was uh, a bit of shock for all of us because, of course, he had to keep it a secret. It wasn't yes. sanctioned, and it sends uh, uh, re reverberations throughout the, the extended family, yeah. and uh, that started, you know, uh, people thinking about uh, what needs to happen. And we need to keep in mind that we are actually, as a people group, uh, are quite accustomed to movement, right? Because uh, our great-grandfather, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, uh, and my maternal grandfather, they both uh, fled China, left China in the 1920s. Right. And uh, my dad, uh, great maternal great-grandfather, left in the late 1800s. And so uh, it's actually built in our DNA because we're not just, we're Chinese, but ethnically, we're, and um, ethnically we're also the, uh, what they call the Hakka in Cantonese, or the Keju, which is in Mandarin. And actually the, the, the dialect group, or the people group, is actually called the guest people. Because as a people group, we have been constantly moving for the last hundreds of years. And yeah. so this was a, just another series of movement, of, of my transmigration that we're experiencing. So in some way for us, uh, it's built in. You're saying that things are not working out here anymore. We, we had some good time here. We've settled for at least a couple of generations, but yet the time has come now to move. Right, okay. So can you talk about that? Can you talk about 
of when the family makes a decision to leave yeah. and what, how you, the steps that you went through yeah. for that to happen. So the, first of all, we didn't have the capital to leave early on. So the other groups that left. And so my dad became, uh, because he was very, uh, he had the gift of networking and influencing and being the, the middle person. And so he did a lot of work in terms of helping people go through the registration, the documentation process of getting them registered and, and being the middle person. And in the process, he was able to earn uh, some commission. And so he did a lot of that. He was very intense. I still remember that time. And his focus was, I don't have enough capital for my family, but I can build on it if I do this. And so the windows of opportunity, we don't know how long it's going to be. And so there was a, um, a significant push to do that. And so initially, uh, my mom said to my dad, I said, you know what, um, I think you and the oldest boy should go. And, and, and that was actually quite a, very much a reality for, for many people. You didn't have enough capital to get your, uh, your whole family to go. You pick who to go and send them, okay. right? Uh, and that's very really much consistent with in terms of uh, our... Uh, our, our, our people group's decision, just like my, uh, both my grandfathers just left on their own first. Okay. My maternal grandfather left uh, first and then settled. And then um, when he had settled, he sent for his wife to join him. Okay. Right? So that's just part of what needs to happen. Yes. It ha looking back, and I said, I'm very thankful that you know, being settled, well, I didn't have to make that kind of choice. But two generations to me where husband and wife had to con contemplate the, the separation just because of necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, we have another uncle who is married to my great aunt, auntie number, great auntie number eight. And he said to my dad, said, you either go as a family or you don't go. Okay. Yeah, great uncle knew the hardship that came with our families when you split. Mm -hmm. Because when you split, uh, you may never know when you're gonna get together again. Right. And in some cases, you never get together again because life happened, the circumstances happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so both my uh, un great uncle number eight and my maternal grandfather said, uh, you know what, we will top up how much do you need? And so they oh. gave a gift to my, uh, my parents oh, okay. and then said, take this and go. Okay. And so that's when, my mom needed to be more convincing because, you know, she's very much of a grounded in, in being a part of that country and the family and the safety because now you're just getting on a boat and leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, dad said, you know what, what is our future here? But more importantly, what is the future of our children? And uh, how can we secure for them? We don't see it. You know, I, I fought and I was, or I was part of the... Uh, Southern Vietnamese Army, and so chances are our children will not be able to access those opportunities. Yes. And true enough, he's, he was wise in thinking along that line because, yeah, you know, um, there's not as many opportunities those who are defeated. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that I still remember coming back to school and uh, going into the, uh, the dining room, and my mom and dad said, you know, we are leaving. And so, you know, for me, uh, I wasn't burdened by all the worries and the care. I was a nine-year-old and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, we're leaving. So, uh, for me, it was a bit of an adventure. It okay. looked like an adventure. Right. Okay. So, uh, the, the decision is made and you're, you're, you're leaving. So, could you describe the steps that the, the family went through to leave from, from that moment on? So it was quite quick. Uh, things happened very quickly. Okay. And so basically then, uh, you know, I mean, we only had, uh, I don't remember exactly how many days, but it was a matter of days and weeks, a couple of weeks maybe, just to get ourselves ready to go. It was like, okay, well, you know what? We, we need to take our wealth, whatever we had left, right? Mm -hmm. So because uh, you need that for the time ahead yep. and uh, pack what you uh, basically need. and. Uh, and be prepared to go. I mean, one, one pack per person, bring some food with you uh, and uh, medicine. And uh, you know, at that time too, I mean, I cannot begin to imagine what my mom had to, to do to get ready. I mean, uh, she had, uh, I mean, she had lo just lost uh, a son a couple of years before. She has a nine-year-old and she has a five-year-old. Uh, at that time, 
she near the end she gave birth to two daughters. One was uh, my sister, uh, is, the oldest is two, and the youngest six months. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I still remember one of the key things to get ready was uh, she took uh, both my sisters to get a picture taken for ID purpose. Okay. And that picture is very dear to. Uh, to my mom and my two sisters because it captures them a moment in time. And so that's a very, very tangible way of getting ready. But in terms of, uh, there was not much to get ready because we didn't have a lot of stuff, mm. right? Uh, the hard part was preparing to say goodbye okay. to uh, the people that love us. Yes. And so, yeah, I mean, it was tough. And I, I think the best way to capture is, you know, is I still remember the day of the departure and my uh, maternal grandfather um, sat down beside me in the early morning uh, in, the, um, in the, the door to the side that leads from our kitchen into like a little uh, place where there is a, a cannonball tree or a star fruit tree. And, you know, and so the closest we come to hugging and say I love you is that, you know, he said, uh, be a good boy and, um, you know, study hard because uh, make our family proud. Yes. So I had a good cry, and you can see the tears in his eyes, too. And then uh, we got ready to go. It's, uh, you know, the next part of the story is that what could have been, and we're thankful that it wasn't the case. My dad had rented, um, charter a, uh, a vehicle at the next door neighbor to, to take us to the staging point. Uh, and so my brother and my uncle and a number of people that were going with us went first. And then we waited, and I still remember that day waiting. And of course, I had two shorts on, two pair of pants, three shirts, and a jacket on. It was getting, and uh, you know, it took a while. I was wonder why that's the case. And then a person came back and said he dropped off the first wave of people, but his vehicle broke down. Oh. And so my again, great uncle number eight, the great intervener, basically, okay, we're just going to hire someone to take you there. Oh, okay. And then we got there, and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're still waiting, and say. We can't wait anymore. He, and he hired another person, took us to the launching point. And so when we got there, I was like, oh no, the boat had already left. Oh. It was, uh, it was, and this is the official boat, right? It was starting it, uh, it, it round. And so we were able to, again, people work hard. They gave some cash and some, uh, you know, we call it, um, you know, appreciation uh, funds to the right people. And thank goodness they loaded up on a boat uh, with the, uh, the provincial police, and they took us out to the official boat and handed us in. When you say the launching point, do you remember where that was? Uh, that would be in Vung Tao. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you left on the boat with, uh, with other families? or? Uh, yeah, so okay. the boat is an official boat, and it okay. was, uh, was owner-occupied. Okay. So there was uh, uh, someone who had the capital to put together, say, I'm going to put together a boat and I'm going to pay the government this much money in order to release people. And so, you know, I think it was that time, was it was a, an adult pay seven tails, six or seven tails, and then children pay three. Okay. okay so basically, yeah, they, they front end of the money, and then they need to finance their own uh, journey out. And so uh, the boat was, I believe, 18 meter by two and a half meters. Okay. And then it was loaded down with 202 people. Oh, 202 people. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I still remember it's that that zero two two or zero two. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was cramped. It was yeah. a it was a it was a good boat. I mean, relatively apparently, the engine was solid. We had a good uh, pilot. And I remember, it was own, own and occupied. Again, yes. this was part of my dad's planning, right? And saying, right. Um, you know, which boat is good, you know, and then uh, and and he chose a boat. He chose well. Yes. I mean, it was crowded. Uh, all the young people were sent down into hole. I mean, it was we was packed like uh, sardine into the boat, and then the the women, the children, the old people were on the top. Okay. But you know, uh, essentially, the moment we were put on the boat, everybody had this much space for the entire time. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So you, can you can you describe the uh, the your journey from there? Please. Yeah, so uh, again, later on, I was told that uh, because many of the boats were so loaded with, uh, with people, they were very mindful to, uh, to travel during um, the April season when it's not as much uh, 
the weather was, chances of the weather was better and the, uh, one, the ocean condition was better. And so, yeah, we, we travel. Our journey uh, from Vietnam to Malaysia took five days and four nights. Okay. And it was a steady, steady, just, you know, I can still remember the, the steady drone of the engine. Boom, 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 boom. We would load it down. We were not fast at all. And we're hoping, and praying, it's like, there, let there be no pirates, let there be no pirates. And so we took a charter. Um, I think, the, you know, the, based on the experience that people are hearing, they try to stay away from the Thai land base, and we're heading for Malaysia. And so, yeah, it was, it was interesting traveling. You know, we, I've always been a Delta person in a river. All of a sudden, you're just faced with this huge, vast ocean. Mm. You know, I still remember coming across in the evening an oil rig and seeing the um, bright light just shining, it's like just watching on shot with fascination. And then every now and then, when you get close to the coast, you see like these little um, rocked islands around. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, it was it was uh, it was a tough time, uh, but we were very as a, as a group of two hundred two so on this, and so we were blessed of not having to run into pirates. And we had to make sure that food and water. We basically had. Uh, water and there were basically these cannons of water right behind our back and then uh, food was uh, instant noodle you know you know, with the pack instant noodle and just put in water and uh, if you were lucky enough uh, they, they bring out a little bit of provision and that would be in that uh, chikamas chikamas nice and chewy and uh, had some water on it so yeah a little bit of that and so my mom, I still remember asking for hot water it's just to make formula for my little sister. And then she was quite mad when uh, one of the, uh, the crew members, you know, because she asked, she was, the guy took and threw in the river, uh, threw in the ocean. Oh. Yeah, so basically, yeah, you, you just make do with what you got or mm. make do with what you don't have. Yeah. And so that was, that was hard, five days and four nights, and we were cramped. I, just to this day and say, how do we do it? And, and we did it because it's based on necessity and circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. So eventually we, we made it down to the coast. And I think uh, what I was told by the people older than me was that we, we try to go into the Singapore area, but we're pretty well turned back because Singapore wasn't turning, uh, taking people at that time. Right. So we traveled back along the coast and just trying to place to, uh, to, um, to land. And so someone online, the decision makers, decided to find uh, a deserted island that was close to the mainland. And then it was like, okay, we're just going to exit here. And so, you know, it was uh, basically came as close to the shore as you could. And you send the young men over to, to pull on the rope and basically set up a, um, a human chain to start helping everybody else, like the kids, uh, the young kids, and the babies, and the mums, the elderly. My sister was, uh, was, you know, way, she was six months, and then my mom was up top, and then the the the, the, the strong young man said, "No, oh, keep us, throw us the baby." <laughs> my mom threw the baby, <laughs> okay. caught her, and moved her in, and then when everybody was unloaded, it was uh, th this was the afternoon when it started. They started set up camp, and then the captain and the pilot basically took the ship and ran it around. Oh, okay, ran it around. And then basically they they ran it around because they didn't want to be towed out. Right. Yeah. So they were just like going to sabotage ship. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then basically everybody started to uh, gather around their uh, their natural groups. So just to give some background, my family consists of six of us, but at the same time there were a number of uh, of friends and relatives who okay. also entrusted their sons and daughters to my dad's care. Oh, okay. Now, in terms of like, you know, many of them are over 18, whatever the case may be, but he was uncle. And so many of that family couldn't, again, couldn't send the whole family. So they sent, like, in one case, an oldest son with an uncle, another son, and then the three children of the family. And so okay. we were, uh, I guess the Vietnamese would call Ho, which is like a family group of 16. So okay. with these 10 of these young people, including my uh, great uncle, my uncle, who were part of that group okay. for initial. Can you describe what your experience was like? Uh, <coughs> did you live for a, a time on that island? Uh, yes, it, we. I, I, you know what? In terms of ex remembering exact days, we don't. That's uh, right. But uh, yeah, it. You know what? That probably that 
that time in the island was um, probably for me enjoyable okay. because I was right by the ocean, right? right. Uh, the biggest thing was uh, finding food. You know, we were running a low of, of provision, and so there's in that island we were all camp along the beach, and uh, on one side is beautiful like swimming time, and then on the other side was pretty rocky. Okay. And so we discovered in the rock you can get snails and various different sea crustaceans. And so when it was low tide, we would go and, and basically find proteins. And sure enough, as a number of days go by, you know, with 202 people to feed, you pretty well start to clean up everything. So thank goodness, within probably a week, we were discovered by the local people who then told the Malaysians uh, army. And so they sent an army unit uh, of probably about five, six guys, army soldiers, just to, uh, you know, camp alongside, keep things safe. And then, thank goodness, they started bringing uh, supplies to us. Okay. And by supplies, rice and sardine. Okay. And um, rice and sardine and some cookies. Okay. Yeah. We, <coughs> to this day, I, I still have fond memories of rice and sardines. <laughs> yes, but rice I and would, sardines. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to eat too much rice and sardines. Maybe now and then, you know, right. once a year, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we were there for a while, and you know, while we were there, we just you know, learned to be cope as a community of two hundred two people. Yeah. Learn to set up our own system to uh, to share food in a way that's equitable. Uh, we had one older as uh, uh, auntie who had uh, English, so she became our interpreters, and so yeah, we we uh, it was we learned to live in the community within our own respective groups. So it was almost like a mini village. Right. Okay. And so we were there for about probably three or four weeks, and then at that point they were able to arrange for us to take us by boat to the actual um, army encampment where the soldiers were based out of. Okay. And so that was in another area where there was a, uh, uh, again, we were living by the beach, and then there was an open ground, parade ground, and so that was much more in mainland and was closer in. And so the soldiers started to, you know, we found ways of, of we can't eat rice and sardine all the time. And so that's when people start saying to the soldier, well, here's some money, can you go buy us stuff? And so that's what they did in terms okay. of being able to uh, access that opportunity. So that was, uh, we call the second camp. And, uh, and it was interesting too because, you know, uh, they were, we were contained. We had no barbed wire fence, but the idea is you can't go to the space. And so when some of the young men try to sneak out of the camp to go, uh, they were caught when they were punished. Yeah, oh, okay. You know, say, okay, in that case, you can lie in the middle of the uh, the sun and we'll put blankets over you and heat things up for you. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, they're kind of like a hot hot chamber thing. Kind of, and I still remember the, the interpreters who was, she was just pretty a bit distraught about it. And they, she asked for mercy, but uh, in the, the, uh, we had a pretty good, uh, you know, army commander, the captain, whatever his rank was. He he was quite a, uh, you know, he he had he had his order to follow, but he was a humane gentleman. I still remember when when the kid was sick, uh, he came and you know he, he in his own way he he took his ring, he blessed with water, and he, you know, blessed the child too. So you know that that there's a lot of humanity there yeah. to do that. So. You know, it wasn't hard, but it was like it was very clear that you were very much contained to that place. Yeah. And so uh, after that, uh, basically, we came into contact with the Red Cross, or not the Red Cross, but it would be the Red Crescent. Okay. Yeah, there's no Red Cross in a Muslim country. Red Crescent, and it was beautiful. We had all these buses and these uh, Red Cro Crescent workers come, and we were loaded up. And next thing you know, we had. Uh, we thought with royal treatment, you know, going from 18 meter by two and a half to like, you know, a number of buses, you know, we had our own seat. They took us to um, this place called Messing, the city, right by the, uh, the coast there. Great treatment. And then we got pulled up into um, what looks like a, a soccer field. And then now you know, the reality set in. Uh, basically, it was thousands and thousands of people squeezed into a soccer yes. field. And everything was stacked together, and it was like, oh my goodness, it was, uh, you know, it was not the best condition. There was no shade, you know, all no. the sun, 
and uh, you know you expose when the sun comes out and uh, you had close thousands I don't know there were thousands of people that were on yeah. uh, in that field now we had a bit of a basketball court next door but you know there was not a basketball it was used as a shelter as well and so we were surrounded by um, by um, by houses because if you look back in those countries uh, in, in Malaysia there would be the open sewer so the soccer field and then the open sewer and then the house on the other side and so we discovered that many of them were uh, Ch ethnic Chinese and so this is where my dad was able to by this time uh, just to give some background that group of 16 many of those young people wanted to strike on their own okay and so pretty well we were down just just uh, you know uh, our, my dad's three two nephew and niece were the only one left with us everybody else had kind of spread out because okay. they wanted their own uh, place uh, not, not a lot just basically like 10 and so basically uh, my dad was able to use his language skills and also his uh, his talent as a, a trader to basically arrange for you know um, sales of uh, you know gold and and jewelry for other people mm -hmm. and then we he would receive they would give a commission and so he was able to build up again capital okay. so, um, and uh, I still remember that one time though he did get caught doing that oh. and so he was. My mom was quite concerned about that because they interrogated him. They uh, they slapped him around a bit, and, you know, so it 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 came with risks as well. Mm. Uh, but you know what? You you do what you can to make sure that your family is cared for. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. So the closest brush that we have to being something happening was that one day the um, the the Malaysian authority came in and swooped in and took about a third of us. All of a sudden, like, you know, okay, we're taking you. And they, what we believe they did was load these uh, other citizens onto uh, these boats and pull them out. Okay. Yeah. So I think that we would have been the next. But, I, you know, the uh, some of the members of the uh, UNHCR was able to see our camp. And so okay. that put a stop to that. And so they basically then said, okay, that's fine. Then you're going to go into one of the official camp. And so we, because Messing was a port city, they took us down to the port area and then took us out to Bulutanga. Okay. Okay. So I think Bulutbidang and Bulutanga were the two. Bulutbidang was the bigger camp, and Bulutanga was the second one. So okay. we ended up in Bulutanga. Okay. Yeah. Which was a refugee camp. Yes, in yep. Malaysia. Okay. Uh, Bulut was simply island, I guess. Okay. I think it was on um, survivors in the early days. Bulutanga was one of the places that site to it. So we, when we got to Bulotanga, we, we met up with people that we knew, and we stayed with this other family for a while. And uh, it was out of, I mean, uh, it was a classmate of mine. But uh, in that transition coming over, his dad was lost at sea. Oh. And so it was a mutually beneficial arrangement. We came and lived there, and so family could share. We shared, basically, everything was jiao on jiao. Everything was stacked so close together. And so at that time, my dad again continued always looking, um, how can I care for my family? And at that time, he built up enough capital. So he found a house, or not a house, but a thatch hut. Yes. And the key thing about that was it had its own well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So before all that, everybody had to go and basically, you know, get uh, water at the public citizen. He was very mindful and saying, I, he, he used the, the, um, the fund that was given to him as a, as a metal person to purchase a house, a hut with a well. And so okay. uh, we're very thankful for that. So we were settled, and uh, it was interesting. You're as settled as you can be. And yeah. by this time, the bulletin guy with so many people, it basically it was a sea of huts from nor they had the northern section, the central sections where the basically you had the, uh, the port where uh, people would come in and out where the supplies would come in and we live in the south side and so uh, you know some of the early memories I have of that would have been you want to go to the bathroom then you have to go into the uh, the place basically the bathroom hung over the ocean okay they just go there do what you need to do and then the fish will eat it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just be mindful what fish you eat yeah. uh, and then um, uh, yes um, Another memory would have been the just the trees were just all cut down for for firewood because okay. with that many people yeah. you need to cook right yes. and so I mean the trees were cut down and then eventually people were basically even 
cutting away at the stump to get wood. Oh. And okay. so one of the jobs that I would have was to forage for branches whenever I can. And so uh, at that time, too, as the oldest, too, I was doing a lot of child care. So basically, I, when my mom said, you know, the neighbor said, yeah, I, you know, I, I was walking with my youngest sister, walking down the hill, and because of the erosion, you slip and fall. So both of us took a tumble and rolled down the hill. But I was saying, your kids are so cute because they just got up and just kept on going. So, okay. You know, the early sign of resiliency and agency comes through in that way. Yes. Uh, and you had to because, you know, the hygiene was something that you always had to be mindful when you had that many people living together. Yes, of course. And so, you know, the one thing that my mom always recalled was uh, when the sun would set, you can see the rats start coming out. And they will march like little like, like armies across the roof of your hut. They run. They run. And so, uh, uh, yeah. She still remember what the one time when she was, uh, we would uh, sleep and you have like the mosquito netting, right? And so she, once she had a finger outside the mosquito netting, and she dreamt that something was chewing on her fingers. And yes, it was a rat chewing on her finger. Oh, wow. Her blood. So it's like, uh, so my sister still kind of cringe every time she hear that story. So with that kind of uh, conditions, it wasn't ideal. There was no schooling. Uh, my dad was very mindful. Was, yeah, this is probably not a good place to stay. Mm. And so you could tell by that time there were people who stayed longer. Like they, they would be really sunburned, like a lot of young men. Their, their hair would be lighter too. Many people would have stayed like two years already okay. because many of the people wanted to focus on going to the United States. Right. And so my dad, being a, a soldier, would have had a priority to, to, to be going. But... He was very mindful, yeah, if you want to stay, you're going to have to wait. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying, yeah, you know what, let's, let's try other countries. And so we still remember uh, that uh, there's a boat that would take all these different um, diplomats or, um, from different countries into the, uh, <clears throat> or basically members of the foreign service of different countries to the camp. And so there's a, the central admin area, so they would gather, they would interview people. So if you wanted to go to a certain country, you put your name in for consideration the interview and so I don't I still this day I don't know why dad put us in for Canada but he did and so we actually interviewed only with Canada okay if they would there was Norway there was Holland there was Ireland there was you know Australia United States England but he put our name in for Canada okay. and I never understood why he did that I very very much appreciate that he did it <laughs> uh, and so I still remember our family going there, and basically we were there, and uh, just some observations. All the other foreign affairs uh, officials, you know, pretty decent shirts, maybe tie, pants. Uh, the Canadian guy is like uh, torn jeans, Hawaiian shirts, kind of ponytail glasses. And it's like, oh, and it's interesting too because, you know, because he interviews so many people, and you know, you know why are you in view Canada? You look so poor, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you don't judge a book by the cover. Right. You enjoy the book. And so he asked me good questions. And one of them was, uh, okay, uh, is this your family? And then my dad said, well, I have my, uh, my brother and Ray, uh, my uncle. They don't live in the same unit as they used to. But then, so they brought the uncles in too, so they interviewed us. And so, you know, the interview was done and a period of time passed by. And then there's a ritual that happens. <clears throat> where if you accepted to the country, they would make an uh, announcement. Right. And so here are the people that have been accepted for Holland. Here's the people that have been accepted for uh, Ireland or Australia. And so Canada came, and they read the names. And you could see my dad just listening. And then when she, he heard his name and my mom's name and all name, he just jumped up and just ran around just celebrating. So, so you, so there were loudspeakers announcing to the individuals. Yeah, throughout the entire camp. Okay. It's a very open process. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, we we basically got accepted pretty quickly, and then uh, shortly after that, it was like the boat basically came, took us uh, from the Pulotenga, took us to Messing, got onto the bus, and it was off to Kuala Lumpur. Okay. So in Kuala Lumpur, there were two camps. The first initial camp is for the medical checkup, right, and all the documentations that need to happen to make sure that you're ready to travel. And so, yeah, I mean, throughout this entire time, too, I, uh, I tell my kids, they say, you know, yeah, 
I was actually, uh, because your grandfather was so busy in terms of doing the networking and influencing, yeah, your grandmother depend on me to take care of you. And then I actually was the one who lined up the food. Okay. And so to this day, you know, that part of like always looking for food for people, it's part of my responsibility. I, I, I tend to gravitate to that. Okay. So because I was, I was nine, I was probably the one who lined up, right? And then I basically would just get the food that I need to bring back to my family. Okay. So at the new, at the, the, the first processing center, it was next to a Catholic uh, church. Uh, you know, the, the nuns were quite um, gracious and helpful to with us at that time. And so by this time, because everybody kind of a sense of we're going to this way, uh, we're very thankful. But there were also sad stories as well because you didn't pass your medical. Mm. Like one family where it's like the young man, okay, I've got diagnosed with uh, TB. Oh. So I, I can't go with my family. They're going to okay. go with first without me. Oh. And so I have to go and, and rest and recover. So you see those, even the story played yes. out with the separation. So really, once you clear that camp and go to the second and final camp, that's when you have to self with oh, yes, yes, whatever. Okay. So we went to the final staging camp there, and you can see there where people are much more relaxed and much more thankful because, you know, they're just waiting for the plane, right. waiting for the plane. Yeah. Can I ask you, uh, at the refugee camp, before you left to come to Kuala Lumpur, do you recall how long you had been there, how long you had stayed there? So if I were to yeah, re-engineer that, that was probably would have been around the June, August, September around there. Okay. Yeah. Of what year? Of 1979. Okay. We left in April of 1979, and we right. came here by November. So our journey was quite compressed. Okay. And that's because my dad said, we're not waiting for the United States. We're not waiting. Right. We're picking a tree that's prepared to, um, to right. take us. So in November, you were in Kuala Lumpur. So we've been on uh, like September, October. In okay. Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. And then July, August, September would have been in Pulau Tenga. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, September, by September... You were in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, well, I'm thinking we were in Kuala Lumpur from right. the first camp. Yeah. Right, and you would have been there for a short period, I'm assuming. Yeah, for like basically the medical checkup, right. the documentations. Yeah. Then once it was clear, October we were in uh, right. the, the final camp. Okay. And then November, November first or second, on we basically one evening it was like here you go, take you the back road to the uh, the back way to the um, the airport. There was Air Canada waiting for us. On we go and off we went. Okay. Yeah. And you flew to? So from there, we flew uh, transiting to Japan and then from Japan uh, across the uh, Pacific and uh, landed in uh, Montreal. Montreal. So okay. we were in Montreal uh, section with the, um, and that's where we landed and then we stayed in the um, army camp okay. in Montreal. And so the, you would have still been around nine years old. I, I turned 10. Oh, you were I 10? I turned 10 when I landed. Okay. So I was thinking that's why. I was like, yeah, did I leave November 1st? I have to check with my mom. But I was 10 when I landed. Okay. Yeah. So can you describe what the experience was like landing in Montreal and the steps that you went through? Yeah, so, you know, you landing and you look out and then it was like, uh, why are those people looking like they're smoking but they don't have cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> that was a little ten year old. Was like, yeah, so we, well, I found soon enough. Yeah, it's a bit cold. It wasn't cold with chilly. There was no snow yet, right. and so we landed. And then there was these soldiers that kind of moved us through the the process. And so uh, I still remember again, bus a bus ride from the uh, the, the airport, and then you know just looking out into the countryside, and then you know like, oh look at the two low white kids, uh, you know the two white uh, boys, kind of like tussling with each other outdoor, right? just little things like that, right? Yes. saying that we're now safe and all that. And so we went to the camp, and then basically when we got there, we were assigned to bunks, right? So the men were on one side, the women's on one side. And so we didn't realize it, but uh, we were in for some de-lousing. Oh. And so, yeah, basically on each of our bunk bed, there was a, a, a paper robe that we wore, and then we'd line up, and then yeah, we waited to get in, and they didn't give us, the soldiers were there, didn't give us much choice. A big dollop of, uh, of, of, of shampoo right in our head. And okay. Of course, while this was happening, um, the, you know, hot water ran out. 
Oh. So it was cold water. My dad said, okay, just going to wipe you up quickly and then take you out of this cold. And so, yeah, we, it was, uh, we appreciate that time because we uh, basically had a warm place to sleep. And, you know, the food was rather strange because we're not accustomed to it. Yes. We're all looking for rice with no rice. We came across these things that are kind of like bubbly, squishy, the green and red. Found out later there were jellos. You know, but the, the rice was uh, were cold, and it's like, okay, well, it's going to take some getting used to here. And then, of course, we uh, went through, and I loved that. I mean, there were these uh, gracious uh, ladies who basically took us through, like, a clothing uh, depot and made sure that we all, we had really nice jackets. I still remember the, the navy blue jacket with the orange um, liner on the inside and mm -hmm. red mitts. Yeah, well, they actually, I think we got, like, pretty new stuff. So. Okay very much appreciate that and then uh, the um, my parents and family would call in to uh, meet with the officials and there was actually an interpreter to basically basically inform my parents that uh, we have a sponsor family oh, or okay. a sponsor group uh, in this place called Birdo Manitoba and that uh, initially they were supposed to take a family of six but uh, they were asked if they can take the uncles as well they said they were willing to do that so we were scheduled to go and so okay. we were there probably in the camp probably three to four days. Okay. And then we'll load up into the um, plane and flew to Winnipeg. Okay. And when we landed, we were uh, basically taken to the Balmoral Hotel. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, I still remember looking out onto, uh, in the Balmoral Hotel, the, um, it's in the central part of the, uh, the city. And looking through the window and just wondering what well, my place in this in this new country. And so to this day, I finally, after all these years, almost ten years ago, I was able to place, give a name to that feeling. And it's interesting because Honorable Senator Justice Murray Sinclair, she said, you know, the sacred duty of an educator is to help children to have an understanding of where they came from, why they're here, where they're going, and who am I. Right. And so I think as best you can, it was a, it was a, a providential and destiny-defining moment, a holy moment, I would say, because uh, many years later, I would serve as a principal of Hugh John McDonald School, which is only like four blocks away oh, okay. from where I stayed. Hmm. So I'm very thankful for that, and now that I'm at Gordon Bell, it's a bit further away, but uh, I haven't gone very far in the last 40 years. Okay. I've been pretty much here. So yeah, we stayed in the Balmoral Hotel, you know, uh, had our first taste of uh, bacon and eggs and hash brown, and discovered that red stuff is not actually a hot chili, it's actually some kind of sweet paste, ketchup. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and then after that, we, uh, the next day, we were pretty well taken to the bus station, which is just three, blo well, four to five blocks away from the Balmoral Hotel, I got on the bus and uh, the Greyhound, and the Greyhound took us out to uh, uh, Trans-Canada heading west, passing through Portage there and interesting too because my th by this time the snow had fallen in Winnipeg mm. and my great uncle said you know you know we've seen those uh, Russian films you know the the uh, the Cossack charging down the uh, the steppes this looked like a lot of the one tour this looked a lot like Siberia okay you know what I'm saying and then it was just my other uncle said what did we do to deserve like being sent at the new economic zone it looks like uh, we're sending to like these camp and hopefully that's not the case. Yes. Uh, so we uh, got dropped off in Brandon, and then in Brandon there, I, I still remember to this day, uh, uh, a very kindly sponsor member of the family, uh, sponsor of a group, basically was there with a white van, white van. He's a teacher too, and basically greeted us. And um, uh, we actually, I still remember the Brandon Sun reporter was there, captured pictures of us. Oh, okay. Yeah, so my wife actually, um, uh, my Mennonite wife, after all these years, actually went back in the archive and found the article. So mm -hmm. I'll send that to you too, so you can see okay. it, so you can have that. Okay. And then I still remember the ride, and to this day, I tell them too, I still remember your kindness and how you were so patient with us and drove us from Brandon to Berto. And it was only once we got to Berto that we found that the, uh, upon entry, the house that was set up for us, it was like, now we have a new home. Mm -hmm. And we're very thankful that the communities put together so much uh, care into making sure that we had what we needed to right. start a new life. Okay. So you're settled in your, in your new home, mm -hmm. um, and the whole family was still together at that time? Yes, yeah. So our two uncles were with us as well. We live in the three-bedroom homes. Okay. Yeah. So my parents had one room, 
with the two, uh, my two sisters, and I had a room with my brother and my two uncles had a room. Okay. Yeah. Um, so should I assume that uh, you, the whole family had limited English language skills at the time? Yeah, my dad had uh, okay English language, not to okay. the same extent as the, the lady who was in our group that shared okay. much more. But when he needed to step up, he was the key piece in the, to be in communications with, okay. uh, with the sponsor, uh, our sponsors. Okay. Yeah. And your mother still needed to learn English, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So did they have an opportunity, your parents, to...? Yeah, so they basically had, uh, my dad had a couple, uh, and my uncles had a couple of uh, young men who came and taught them. Oh, okay. And I found out later that these, these two young men uh, had just come back from Belize. Oh. And, and later on, when I was a vice principal at Gordon Bell, the other vice principal, her partner, was one of the young men who taught my dad English. Oh, wow. So hmm. we, vi we live in a very networked world yes. through both geography and time. Right. Yeah, so uh, my mom uh, received instruction from uh, a, 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 teacher, uh, a female teacher okay. who came and taught her. Uh, actually, the Anglican pastor's wife okay. was a teacher. And my brother and I were you know, basically experienced in Canadian elementary school. Okay. Pretty well within a couple of days of our arrival. Okay. Yeah. The uh, we had a we also had uh, that first day that we got there from Brandon, we were hosted by the um, Chinese restaurant owners and his wife. Oh, okay. So it was uh, good to have a, uh, my parents were able to speak Chinese with them. They were f we were fed rice, good rice. We enjoyed it, and I uh, had my first taste of old Dutch potato chips. Okay. Ketchup. Yes, I like it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, fr from then on, uh, so by then uh, you were 10 or, or 11 ten, years old? 10, I was old. 10, yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall um, did, how long did the family stay together? At, at some point you became a young adult? Mm -hmm. you, yeah, so mm -hmm. my, my two uncles, within a short time, they wanted to experience, to, uh, to, to strike on their own. So right. they moved, one moved to Brandon and one moved to... Uh, they eventually one moved to Calgary and one moved to Vancouver. Okay. Right? So they left within four to five months. Uh, we basically stayed, got there in November, and um, by May, my father was able to, with the help of our sponsor, the treasurer actually, uh, had uh, you know was able to assist him in getting a job with the Russell Highway Department. Okay. So he moved first. He moved for a good uh, month and a half to set up uh, in in Russell, and okay. then it was Mum and uh, the the four of us who finish off uh, our school year. And then when June was done, we moved to Russell, Manitoba. Okay. And he worked there for three and a half years okay. uh, in the uh, highway department. And then as well, in the weekend, he started working in the Chinese restaurant. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so he worked seven days a week for a solid number of years there. And uh, it's to this day, people are amazed. Like my parents, who never went into the kitchen, never cooked anything in Vietnam, and all of a sudden he's uh, cooking on the weekend. And so, you know, some will be okay. He said, yeah, I can do this. We were living in subsidized housing at that time. So he actually at one point had three jobs. He had the main job, he had the restaurant, and then he was also kind of like the maintenance guy for uh, the complex uh, okay. where we live. But after a while, it was like, oh, that's just too much. So yeah. he came down to two. And so when the winter got really hard for him, you know, it was a little, the Vietnamese Chinese guy hanging out with all these Polish, Ukrainian, the Scottish guy, right? He would say, yeah, you know, I think, to give some background, there were a Chinese uh, doctor couple. And along the line, they say, well, you know, maybe you should consider having a restaurant. And that's what's why you say, okay, well, then I better learn to trade. And so he went and worked there, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, that was a way for a lot of Asian people to uh, make a livelihood. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he did that. And so after about three and a half years, he... Because some of he would say, okay, well, I can do this another year, right? But then the winter would hit and say, yeah, it's time to move. Mm -hmm. And so basically after three and a half years, we, we, we had, for a good solid year and a half, there, we went to a different restaurant and just look at see what I need to. And so we basically found, it wasn't a Chinese restaurant. It was actually a pizza and chicken place. Okay. And so we didn't necessarily have enough capital yet, um, but due to the kindness of the, uh, the two doc Chinese doctors, they said, we'll co-sign the loan for you. Okay. Yeah. So, I always remember that. You know, it's, do it, not expect anything. It should be of assistance to others, right? So, we then bought the restaurant in uh, Rosswood, Manitoba. Okay. And uh, 
not very original, but very purposeful. And then our restaurant, Ninden Land Restaurant. Yeah, and it got the Coca Cola sign there. I think it's still there. Okay. And then our restaurant, yeah. Hmm. And so that was how we, uh, you know, dive into being Canadians. Right. My parents were, my mom especially was very intentional and said, you know what? While I'm raising my children, I just need them to be in closer together in this new right. country. So the restaurant actually had a house attached to it right in the back. So oh, okay. everything was in one. All you had to do was open the back door of the kitchen, and you were now dining room and kitchen. And you, all you had to do was step over, go down the basement. That was our living quarter as well. Okay. And so we were there for a solid 10 years, oh, okay. yeah, from uh, 1983 to 1993. Okay. 10 years, and basically, yeah, we, we would close for uh, Christmas, Boxing Day, and New Year's Day. And Otherwise, the restaurant was restaurant, open. Yeah, the restaurant was open. Later on, my parents took a little break on Monday. They would actually have workers work, and they would kind of stay back a bit and rest, okay. which is good. Yeah, and of course, weekend were always busy. Chinese smorgasbord on Sunday. Uh, later, when we were adults, my brother said, "You know, do you remember how we used to dread Friday because we would finish school and end up working really hard, and now we as uh, working people Monday to Friday, we look forward to our weekends." Yes. <laughs> So things had changed for our family in that way. Right. But uh, yeah, we dived deep into it. Uh, we were in Moose. So by then, uh, we, we picked up both the uh, vernacular language and also the academic language pretty quick. Okay. Right? Because we, you had to drive pretty far to find another Asian person. Right? Oh, okay. And so we were totally in Moose there. And uh, basically, yeah, for me the, and, uh, um, and then my siblings, uh, our, our, our Canadian identity was, was much more accelerated because we didn't go to the city. We were mm -hmm. in Sinex, surrounded by a lot of other people who spoke Vietnamese or Chinese. Okay. And so that was a very deliberate decision by my parents. They're saying, You're, we're in this country right now. We need to be very mindful to fully, uh, as best we can, right, um, take on the responsibility of what it means to be Canadian, including yes. the, the language, the culture, while being very mindful to be strong in our identity as, right. as, as Vietnamese and as Chinese. So during that period, there were opportunities for you to associate with other Vietnamese individuals? Yeah, so that would be in the, you know, usually it would be Monday. Yeah. Uh, you know, my parents would, would, uh, would drive in on Mondays to, to meet with other people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So not a lot, though, not a long time, right. uh, especially in the early years where we had to dive into it. W later on, when, um, when I was older, uh, they actually basically accelerated. They basically left my brother and I in charge. Okay. So they would go in. And uh, in one year, they, and then good for them, they, they went and visit people in Toronto and Boston, New York. My oh. brother and I ran the restaurant. Okay. Yeah. And then we would split it too because they were very mindful to give opportunity to us. Expo 86, uh, my dad and I, and my brother went to Expo 86. We came back. And my mom and my two sisters went to San Jose to vi visit her grand her mom. Oh, okay. So that's how we did it. We never right. went as a group. Yes. We always make sure that we went in, in different groupings okay. so that we still had the opportunity to enjoy and to see and things. Yeah. Okay. But it, it got pretty busy. I mean, we expanded. I mean, we were basically the, uh, the one-stop place. I mean, we served pizza and chicken. That was what the restaurant had served. But we also served Ukrainian foods, and we, we opened up the Chinese food portion. In the last four years, we we discovered the uh, the joy of catering, okay. Ukrainians and Polish and uh, English weddings. So we basically did a lot of catering in the summertime. So yeah, Monday to Friday was restaurant business, and Saturday was a catering and a social or something like that, and Sunday was a smorgasbord. And uh, yeah, okay. So can you talk about your life? I'm assuming you pursued your education. Yeah, and. Uh, did you get married at some point? So yeah, I I, I actually left uh, my hometown Rossburn when I was uh, after grade ten to come to uh, school here in the city. Uh, okay. I went to Dakota and got my um, finished high school here. Yeah. And then uh, I then I went on to University of Manitoba, got a bachelor of education. Okay. So throughout this entire time, I would always go home in the summer to help out. Mm -hmm. So. So I didn't have the whole 10 years experience in, in Rossburn. I had pretty well six, four years, mm -hmm. and then four years where I would come back and, and, and be a help during right. the summer. And so in the early days there, teaching jobs were few and far in between. So 
Uh, by 93, my parents, like, you know, they're saying, yeah, this is, this is not sustainable. We knew it wasn't sustainable. You can't keep up with the kind of pace. And so my dad, being the five-year-old son that he was, you know, wanted to make sure that he was close to his dad in Calgary. And by that time, my brother was graduating too, and he mm -hmm. was ready to go. So he applied to University of Calgary, and so we made the decision to sell the restaurant okay. and go to Calgary. I uh, went with them initially, but there were very few jobs for teachers across Canada. So I was called back for an interview, and I got a teaching job here in the in Winnipeg Wexford. School Division, with Jenna Wolf School, okay. in '93. And it's been 27 years uh, of oh. working in the, in the inner city. Mm -hmm. uh, I jokingly tell people, you look inside my heart, there's four schools for the four chambers. Jenna Wolf, where I started, Shaughnessy up the north end, and then um, Hugh John, McDonald's, and Gordon Bell. Okay. So all together now, I've served as that 10 years as a teacher, and then four as a vice principal, and then this is my 13 years principal. Okay. Yeah, and, and in 2002, I, I marry uh, my, the love of my life, my, my Mennonite wife, uh, Rebecca Brown. Okay. Yeah. And did you have children? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, we had three years of uh, bliss as, uh, you know, uh, with no kids. And then mm -hmm. we decided to have kids. And yeah. so uh, I have uh, my oldest is Leanne. She's 14 now. And then my second is my aunt. She's 12. And then Ty is 10. And okay. we live just in the West End. Right. Yeah. And to, to this, up to this period, you're still involved, obviously. So you're, you're a, prin a school principal? Yes. Okay. Can you talk about your school and yeah, yeah. what that, that experience is like, so, please? So, you know, when I, when I graduated in 93, I still remember driving down the street called Ellis, and uh, it's in the West End, where many of the Vietnamese, uh, the refugees settle. Mm. And so I, as I was driving along, I, uh, the school I saw, like, a, it's a very distinctive a staircase uh, facing the street, and I saw this group of Asian young people coming out, and I had saying, you know, that's probably where I need to be. So, and that was in April when I had that feeling. Mm -hmm. In August, I was called for an interview for that place. I walked okay. up and I said, I've seen this place before. It was one of those moments, similar to my destiny-defining moment at the window. Mm -hmm. It was the very same school I saw, and I sat the sensor and spoke to them. I go in for the interview, 9, finished by 9.30, 9.40. Drove back to the uh, university, got a phone call by 10.20 saying, how, do you wanna, how would you like to come in and work with us? And so I started working as a teacher there. And, and every year, in those early years, you, because of just the way that things worked out, you would get your, uh, you know, your, 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 your term is finished, so you don't mm -hmm. have a job. And then usually, if you do the work really well, you know, they call back for an interview, you get a job again. So that was like the first three years. And so once things settled, um, yeah, I, I, I got a permanent position. And uh, I loved serving and working with, uh, you know, and these were the children's, these, these are, would be my little brother and sisters. Yes. You know? These are the children of, uh, of the families that, that, that came with me. And so I was very thankful to be able to serve and to care and to learn about them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was pretty well, I was the only Asian teacher in that school. And, uh, you know, the students see it, you know. And uh, I jokingly tell them, like, you know, and, and, and one of the interview questions that the principal asked me, what would you do to engage parents? I said, you know, you do what you can. A lot of parents are working hard. You know, maybe we don't go to. I mean, expect the parents to come to us. We go to them. So, you know, and over the years, uh, I kept to that. You know, I've done my fair share of just follow up with students uh, in terms of like a lot of restaurants. Right? I know the restaurant. Your mom and dad works there. I need to talk to them. They need to talk to me. I'll go have a bowl of pho, and then we'll have a little chat afterwards. Right? Mm -hmm. Just uh, mm -hmm. so th that's what it means to be in the community. That's what it means to support young people in that way. And so I was there for a while, and it was also there that I came across uh, my work with a lot of indigenous students mm -hmm. and other newcomers as well, Filipinos, yeah. uh, you know, the Kurdish group that came in, the Iraqi groups, mm -hmm. right? And so I saw my work as that. Uh, I'm very mindful too, is that I can't be just helping my people group. They, everybody's my people group. Mm -hmm. These are all the students that I serve. Yeah. And so I've been very just thankful for the opportunity to, to work in terms of, I call the work of welcoming hospitality for newcomers who arrive in this country, uh, and also the deep work of, uh, of respectful 
uh, relationships, caring relationship, just relationship, and compassionate relationship with uh, indigenous uh, students and their families. Mm -hmm. I see that as a uh, essential works because you know when it comes down to the end of the day, I'm I'm indigenous too from a different place. Mm -hmm. I'm just happen to be as a guest on this treaty one land. And so I'm very mindful to embrace all the responsibility that comes with it. And mm -hmm. I'm always very mindful to hold on to the privileges I have lightly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know I mean, living in, the, uh, in a context now, have you seen my story, is that privileges come and go. But, you know, the key thing is uh, you can maintain the, 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 what's given to you by the responsibility you, that you embrace fully. Yes. And so that's what I do. And, and then I was on that note that ten, after 10 years of teaching, uh, my dad said, well, have you considered vice principalships? And I just, you know, but I, I, I thought long and hard because I, I, I knew there was going to be a huge price that you would pay in terms of serving that. So I took my time. And then uh, when I finished my graduate study, you know, and, uh, you know, I said, okay, I'll put my name in the hat. And I was appointed vice principal. Uh, I was actually a teacher at Gordon Bell for three years. And then my appointment was within the school. Overnight, okay. I became vice principal, okay. and and Gordon Bell was was and still continued to be one of the key schools that receive and welcome newcomers, and of course the the, the latest wave has been the uh, the Syrian the last number mm -hmm. of three years, mm -hmm. and then uh, lately has been the, uh, some of the Zazidi as well. Okay. Yeah, so well, we have an old saying and, and a very good saying at Gordon Bell is saying you know, uh, watch the news. Depending on the unrest, chances are those students and communities are coming our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. so now I'm back as uh, I served for 11 years as a principal of Hugh John McDonald School. You know, I mentioned that uh, uh, very close to where I first started off, and now I'm back as uh, principal of Gordon Bell for a second year. Okay. Yeah. Well, interesting career. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, <coughs> it's very thankful for the opportunity to serve. And uh, very thankful that I've been able to tell this story, my story, that is also our story, my voice and our voices, in the 40th year of our arrival. Are you ever asked by uh, commu uh, communities, or uh, let's say, let's say you were invited? I know that you're a teacher and yeah. uh, a principal, and you've been involved in, in education in the education for many years, but. Let's say a, a college approached you and asked you to come and tell your story of leaving your <coughs> native country to mm. come and settle in Canada. Mm. Um, what types of things do you think you, you would share with, uh, with the college students? Um, so for a while there, near the end of my three years at Hugh John McDonald Schools, I, I was asked to speak almost once every month oh, okay. in different organizations okay. all over the places. And, and the, always the idea is, how can you ensure and work towards safe, secure, healthy, vibrant, learning, and thriving community? Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Right. And so I've been able to do that. Uh, so it was getting pretty hectic for a while. And I actually spoke at the, uh, one of the conferences, uh, the COF uh, conference that Stephanie had uh, organized a number of years ago. And uh, I actually have an upcoming conference, uh, Strange, uh, um, Stranger in a New Homeland Conference. Oh, okay. That's organized by... Uh, Dr. Michael Buffo in the University of Manitoba. So they're asking me to share my stories specifically. Okay. So, yeah, I have another um, speaking engagement as well with the Manitoba Associate School Superintendent. So I always kind of bring my story into it to say, Daria, this is where I came from. This, this is why I'm here. This mm -hmm. is where I'm going. Who am I? So that's always been a part of who I am in terms okay. of bringing into that work. So, uh, yeah, I, I've lost track of the number of time I, I've spoken. I'm very thankful for it, but it's also a lot of work because it involves preparing your heart and your spirit yes. for it, right? Yeah. And I always, with the time, I say, how can, by sharing my story, can you ins in influence, not even inspire, but influence to, to one day have the confidence to share your story? Because okay. that's part of the responsibility that comes with it. Okay. So for sure on that, uh, when I became my first day as principal at Gordon Bell, I share my story. Okay. Yeah, because you know, my uh, I have an indigenous sister who's a trustee in Brandon. She's in a Facebook posting, and she shared this with me. Know your story. Know your story so well that you can then go into places with confidence mm -hmm. and that you contribute in a good way, in a respectful right. way. Right. And I'm pretty well convinced if you don't know your story, then the work that you do can be good, but it 
may not be as good. No, it, is, it will not be as good as what it could be if right. you don't know your story. Right. So at this point, <coughs> I always ask individuals, uh, one, of the, <coughs> one of the goals of the Hearts of Freedom uh, project is to teach the, 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 the new generations about what happened in that part of history mm -hmm. 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts, any ideas you, you would like to share with them, with that particular uh, population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an old saying somewhere in saying that tears flow down, they don't flow up. Mm. And just like my great, our great, our forebears, our grandmothers and grand, great grandmothers and great grandfathers shed tears for us. Uh, we now shed to the next generation, mm -hmm. and so it is that capacity to shed tears, mm -hmm. the capacity <coughs> to be vulnerable, that we're able to connect to each other in a real way, very real way. Mm -hmm. Brene Brown's basically articulate what the indigenous community know really well, and uh, that uh, you know, um, we can't really be in relationship with each other unless we're prepared to be vulnerable. And as we build that trust and that, 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 that trust that deepens over time, we become increasingly vulnerable to each other. And it is in that way that we can mitigate and we can eventually, um, we can mitigate the, the natural tendency for human beings to power over others and to treat each other with disrespect and to mm. devalue each other and to dehumanize each other. That capacity, empathy, is based on trust and is based on vulnerability. So do that work in a hard way, in, in, a, in a good way, knowing that you will be wounded time and time again and that it will hurt time and time again. Um, you know, Shakespeare once said, you know, it is better to have love and lost than not to love at all. Yes. Because uh, it hurts deeply because you love deeply. Mm. And so I always come back to this in my presentation. I said, um, there are some key lodestone that I put in place for all of us to say, what do human beings need to have a safe, secure, thriving, learning, livelihood, fair future? And I start off with like understanding what relationships mean. And I go back to, you know, whether it's indigenous to here, but in the Middle East, the idea of shalom, peace. Mm -hmm. When we offer that to each other in a good way, what does that really mean? And so I think this is what it means. May you have peace with the beliefs and the values and worldview that you have, whether you are a person of conviction of in terms of humanity mm -hmm. or you're a person of spirituality, you believe in a greater power outside yourself, or a person of faith where you have a specific faith. May it be healthy because mm -hmm. that then is your deep grounding for you to engage in that sense of relationship with yourself. You need to know that you are a person of value. Uh, and the questions that I would say to, to guide you in that is, so who am I? Um, do I matter? Do I have a voice? And do I, have, do I know how to sound my voice? And you should be able to answer all those questions in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. And once you have those, then you have that sense of relationship with each other, that sense of, as a Greek card, koinonia, that fellowship, that sense of connection to each other from soul to soul and heart to heart in a deep way. And then, of course, once you have that, then you can have that relationship with the culture and the land and water in which you're situated, even after you've been relocated. For yeah. example, you know, when I talk about land and water, for me, it's the Red and the Sinemoy River. Just like for my brothers and sisters, it's the Ottawa River. Right? And then we live in the West End, where the trees are framed in a way that's the canopy. That's very much re re reminds me of what it's like traveling the streets of, of Vietnam mm -hmm. and other places. And so that gives the impetus for us to care for the environment, you know. So climate change, yes, I understand it need to happen. But mm -hmm. deeper than that is that sense of we are in relationship with the land and water. And so we have responsibility to it in a good way. Not to exploit, to extract, but to be good stewards of why we're here and hand it to the next generation. Right. And then the second point I brought is the, uh, the work of Dr. Mon Brokenlake <coughs> and Dr. Leigh Brencho and the idea that every human being needs a sense of belonging, that we are loved, that we are cared for, the sense of mastery, the autonomy, that we have talent that we can give, that sense of independence in terms of who we are within the context community, and then that sense of generosity to give of ourselves freely into it. 
Mm. And, uh, and be, when you have all those things, then you can have your first place, your home, your second place, learning a livelihood, and the third place, your community places where you can gather and define for yourself and with others what it means to be a fully contributing member of wherever it is that you've been placed. Mm. I mustn't forget to ask you, um, since you've been in Canada, have you had any opportunities to return to Vietnam? So yes, it's been a while. I returned to Vietnam in 1997, Okay. 17 years after I left. And it's amazing now, 22 years since I've returned. Okay. So I'm way overdue for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, being a busy principal and uh, being a busy dad and a busy husband and a citizen, that doesn't leave a lot of time to travel. Right. Have you st stayed in touch with family and friends in Vietnam? Most of our families have scattered. Oh, yeah. Okay. So most of us, the close families, like you know, first cousins. Yeah. Uh, there's only one left in Bien Hoa. So he, oh, okay. he and his, uh, he's, uh, he is my first cousin. He's my okay. uh, uncle's son. So he keeps the fire burning. Okay. And he goes to visit my, uh, my his, uh, my great aunties and, and my great uncle's uh, grave and my my my, uh, my uh, brother's grave. Mm -hmm. It's all very important for that. And so I'm very glad that he's there. But everybody else has left. Okay. Uh, the biggest concentration of our family is probably Melbourne, Australia. And, uh, and of course, Calgary mm -hmm. and San Jose, Boston, New York, Dallas, Europe. Yeah. Okay. One day, I hope to do the grand tour yes. and reconnect. Meanwhile, Facebook will have to do. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very good. Thank you.